Nancy, okay. uh, Nancy started the recording, so uh, Father in Heaven, in Jesus' name, we ask you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear. Lord, we want to walk this. We want the light. We want the love. We want the sun. We want the light. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Bye, Dennis. All right. Well, welcome back again. I guess this is our fourth session. The first one we didn't have recorded, and uh, but we're we're learning as we go. And uh, I just want to say I, I really appreciate uh, all that everyone's doing to make this possible. I mean, Nancy's working hard at it. We appreciate that. Tim's working hard, you know, to give us a YouTube channel and to uh, uh, to manage uh, you know a website and some things we're working on and. Of course, Steve, <laughs> if it wasn't for Steve, we wouldn't have any of it because it was really his call to me that that uh, opened all this up. So, And we want to thank God because if he doesn't give us this, we'll look kind of foolish because then everybody will know who we really are. <laughs> so we, you know, uh, we're not anything unless he uh, reveals uh, his word to us. And, you know, he can take it away at any time. You know, it's a, the miracle that it takes to receive uh, life and and to receive revelation from him. And it takes the same miracle to keep it. And, uh, you know, if you look, you know, at the parable of the sower, he said, uh, he said, you know, you, you, you sow on different kinds of soil. And, he, you know, it says that it, it fades away. Or it says the demons come and snatch it right out of their hearts. See, it, I it's presumptuous to think we can keep anything. Uh, it's presumptuous to think we can see anything. It's presumptuous to, to think we can keep anything. And the fact that we even can keep it is a miracle of God. And um, so, anyway, we're, um, you know, we've stumbled along just learning. And actually, I kind of like that. I, I, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, if we, uh, you know, it says in, uh, uh, in Paul's writings that, you know, he said because of the revelation that was given to him, he called the surpassing greatness of the revelation. And uh, he said, uh, uh, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh. And he said, that, to keep me from exalting myself. I see God looks at the heart and you say, God, I won't exalt myself. And he says, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll see about that because I'm going to watch your heart. And, um, uh, and see, when he sees something in your heart, you can't see it. We don't know our own hearts. But he can see the, the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so he sends out his little messengers of Satan, which Paul called it, to humble us and um, uh, and to keep us where we need to be. And he knows what's best for us, and uh, we want to be sure and subject ourselves to what God says and not grumble about that, but be open to uh, being corrected at, at all times. And so anyway, when we have struggles and problems uh, doing things, it's okay because uh, if we if he embarrasses us a little bit, he, he knows what we need. And uh, we prefer it wasn't by our own doing. <laughs> so anyway, now um, there's, a, there's a few things I want to mention before we start. Now this, uh, uh, if you don't have, um, uh, you know, this writing, uh, which I'm uh, steadily putting together, I, we're calling it God's entire vision. Now, we're being presumptuous, obviously, with that, because we don't have his entire vision, but he does. <laughs> and uh, as he gives it to us, uh, this is not a teaching. This is the teaching. <laughs> and it's going to have many different parts. And so you'll notice the categories. Some of them don't even have anything under them yet, but it's the category God gave to me, and he's going to fill that in, and you watch it fill in over the weeks. And so anyway, the original teaching was that that I started out with is that, that we're sanctified through living sacrifices and offerings to God. It it's called dying daily. We are sanctified through that. And, you know, the, the church has been deceived and corrupted by teachings, doctrines of the powers of darkness that are, that are deceiving people into believing that they have 
I already got it, and uh, now they can just go on back to the world, enjoy the world, uh, get everything you can get out of it, uh, accumulate everything you can accumulate, because now you already have it. And uh, uh, God is, in this last days, he's revealing that that is not true. That is a false teaching that is destroying people, and that's that's what we uh, set out to do. And uh, But as I began to see this, I mean, I've, for a long time I've seen there's something much bigger. There's not a teaching. There's the teaching, and it's it's from cover to cover in the Bible. It started in Genesis. It ends in Revelation, and it's all about this one thing. And so, anyway, that's what we're out to do. Now, um, there was a, you know, in my lifetime, there was a man, uh, there's been a number of them, but uh, there was a man that one day came into my life, and his name was uh, Jim Standridge. And uh, he he was a pastor of a church, and then he became an evangelist. And uh, and when I met him, uh, you know, I, him and I got, uh, were talking, and I noticed something about him. I noticed that he had ears to hear. And I, you know, I, I can watch a person's countenance when I'm talking to them, and I can tell if they have ears to hear. And uh, and so I began to share with him what I was seeing, and, and he said something to me. He said, um, um, he, he, I, well, I told him, I said, you know, I'm, I'm studying something that I call the resurrection of the dead. And he started chuckling. And I said, Jim, the resurrection of the dead is something totally different than what people are teaching. And he said, yeah, I know. And uh, I said, well, I flipped over, and I'm going to flip to it right now. And this is for you guys to uh, uh, just kind of look at to start things off. But it's in Philippians 3, and uh, I do this sometimes. I just, something comes to my mind, and I take off on it. So, um, uh, you know, the Lord flashes things through my mind, and I'm sure he does yours too. I mean, I'm not, I'm not anything. Um, and um, like I said, when the Lord's working, he makes you look good. <laughs> and people don't really know um, who they're really listening to because it's God that's putting things out. But, but, uh, but anyway, in in, uh, in in Philippians three and verse eleven, he says, "In order that now, you know." I always circle that term in order that. And so so then I have to look above it and see, you know, what's the what's the subject? And he said verse ten says that I may know him. Philippians three ten, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection. Circle that power of his resurrection. And the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now, see, see, when you're taught that if you pray a prayer, acknowledge Jesus is the Son of God, acknowledge Jesus was born of a virgin, he lived a sinless life, he became the perfect sacrifice on the cross, died for our sins, and rose again. If you, if you do that, you have it, Okay. But you basically, when you do that, you leave out the entire Bible because that is not what the um, that is not what the teaching of the Bible says, and uh, and so that doctrine, which is a doctrine of demons, has permeated the Christian church, and it's sending a lot of people the wrong way. And so, you know, you know, Paul said, you know, if I preach circumcision, I wouldn't be persecuted. And, uh, and there's that uh, problem yeah. I'm having with my, uh, I keep mentioning that, and we haven't been able to new computer and I haven't been able to figure out it's something a commercial just start playing in the background I don't know what causes it but I'm learning 
I'm not I'm not the high tech guru, so <laughs> but anyway, um so remember what I told you about that you know, the powers of darkness will always find a way. They'll always find a way to interrupt everything you're doing because and you know, it's it, typically it it's through people, but it's also through technology. So, but uh, anyway, so here we see, you know, we're talking about the power of his resurrection. And then he explains that the fellowship of his sufferings and being conformed to his death. Now, why would, you know, if we, if we have it, if we, if we did that process, which is taught, the four spiritual laws, the Roman road to salvation, you know, there's all kinds. If we did that process, why would we even need to think about being uh, having fellowship of his sufferings or being conformed to his death? It says, in order that I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. And people, well, yeah, you know, that's when you die. You know, I mean, when when the second coming comes or when the, uh, you know, I, I mean, you know, that's when we're, we're resurrection. That's the resurrection. No, that is not the teaching of this Bible. That is a doctrine of demons to keep you from seeing what the resurrection of the dead is. And uh, it says, not that I have already obtained it. Now, you know, why would he say that? If it's someday out there in the, the sweet by and by, why would he use the term uh, you know, obtain, already obtained it. He said, or have already become, look at that word, perfect. But I press on in order that, circle that in order that, I may lay hold of that for which I was laid hold of by Christ Jesus. Brethren, I do not regard myself as having laid hold of it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal. Circle the goal. (laughs) Because that goal is being resurrected from the dead for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. In other words, that means that that's the prize he gave us. That's the upward call. That's the heavenly places in Christ Jesus and that is what we're called to do. And that, um, I mean, I'm talking about 30-some years ago, I saw this uh, thing which I called Finish the Course. And some of you may even run on to tapes out there called Finish the Course that I taught years ago. Uh, one time at a masculine ministry conference, I, I taught the same thing, and they called it the Garments of Salvation. And... Um, uh, anyway, it you know, I, I didn't have what I have now, but I had a bunch then. But I knew that being uh, made complete, being perfect, being the fullness of God, the resurrection of the dead, the redemption of our body, all of these things are being made perfect in Christ. Now, perfect, you know, I mean, there's things hidden behind words you know the word perfect doesn't mean to us as americans what the bible means by perfect it means mature it means complete it means in him it means abiding in him it means um uh you know the fullness of god in bodily form you know uh, it means your tongue is under complete restraint and control by you by the Holy Spirit working through you. So anyway, but notice he says in verse 15, let let us therefore as many as are perfect have this attitude. In other words, have the same attitude. And if in anything you have a different attitude, God will reveal that also to you. He says, I'm not worried about you. Because if, if there's anything, any different attitude, God, God will reveal it. Um, But, uh, however, let us keep living by that same standard in which we have, Mark, attained. Attained is a pretty important word. So, anyway, I'm not, um, you know, that's not my teaching today. But, anyway, when I said that to Jim Standridge, 
he said, uh, have you, I said, you know, I, I'm seeing this in Philippians 3, and I read it to him, and he said, of course, I'm seeing it all over the Bible, but but he said, uh, have you read it in the Amplified? And I said, no. He says, it says exactly what you're saying. I said, really? And then, so anyway, that was, you know, that's one thing I've learned. You know, God sends these people along, and uh, when he does, they come and, and uh uh, and confirm things to you, you know. And uh, he told me, he told me once. He said, you know, he said, Dennis, uh, I have to warn you, uh, people are not going to receive that that gospel. Um, he said, uh, you know, he said, I, I found out the hard way when I I started teaching in my church. They they all started leaving, and uh, so you see, that's why what we're doing right now is so perfect because. We, uh, uh, I can't, can't stop this turn thing. Um, anyway, um, what we're doing is so perfect because the ones that want to hear can hear. The ones that don't want to hear, see, we don't have to have their support. See, once you are in the ministry and you start speaking uh, of these things, why something happens, uh, you know, I mean, people cause havoc, they leave, uh, the church can no longer support it, uh, be supported, and see, so there's a there's an intimidation to keep you from saying things that, uh, that are, uh, um, you know, that are very important, and so, uh, you can't tell the people the whole truth, nothing but the truth, you know. And I, you, get, and I'm not saying, you know, that 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 we we don't dump tough, chewy meat on little babes and cause them to choke. That is a uh, that is something we don't want to do. But at the same time, um, you know, we have to. Uh, speak the truth and we don't want people thinking there's some way when they're where they're not and so anyway now there's uh another scripture i want to um um i want to read to you it's uh second timothy 2 18 and we'll get to our our teaching here and uh, one thing i want to make clear is we're not going down the list that's not what we're doing. Uh, the list is there for you. It's uh, it's for you to study, and in your time of study. I mean, if the only thing you're getting is what I'm sharing on Sunday, I'm sorry, but it's not going to be enough. Not, I mean, I mean we're we're at the we're at a very special time. God would not be revealing this. I've tried for 30 years to see what I'm seeing now, and suddenly, in a matter of weeks, it all opened, and I don't know why. I, I don't know what his plan is, and so I'm just, uh, uh, you know, I, I'm just waiting to see what he's going to do. But there's some reason that this is open. Now, I want you to notice in uh, 2 Timothy, this is 2.18, 2 Timothy 2.18. It says, men who have gone astray, Mark, gone astray, that's real important, from the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and thus they upset the faith of some. Now, just think about that. Who would teach that the resurrection had already taken place? Now, I I know somebody's going to write a big old book explaining why that they uh, thought the resurrection. That's not what it's talking about, folks. The um, the resurrection it's talking about is in you being raised up with Christ mm-hmm. in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, as Jesus Christ is in the world. So am I. You know these. These scriptures are uh, are the resurrection taking place in us, and he said, 
Well, you know what he was really saying there? I'm, I'm going to interpret it for you. Men who have gone astray from the truth by telling you you already have it and you're going to heaven, and it upsets the faith of some. You know why? Because they don't walk in faith anymore because they already have it. The most dangerous right. thing you could ever do to somebody seeking God is tell them they already have it because they'll be destroyed. Because just like when a newborn, I mean, a new baby is conceived, you say, oh, well, we have a baby. Let's get it out and play with it. So, well, you know, wait a minute, honey. That, I mean, it's a little teeny speck. Yeah, but it's a baby. Yes, it's a baby, but but uh, it's not ready for that yet because it hasn't matured yet into the fullness of a baby. It is a baby, but it's not the fullness of a baby. And when you tell somebody, a new babe in Christ, that they already have it, why? They don't know that they're going to be tested. They don't know that they're going to be tried. They don't know the flood's going to come. The wind's going to blow. It's going to smash against that house, and it's going to fall away. And they're going to go, wonder why they didn't stay walking with God. Now, they may be in church the whole time, and, I mean, they might do it all. I mean, they might pray before their meals, and they might do everything, but, I mean, they might mm-hmm. sing and dance, and who knows? I mean, prophesy and everything else, but I'm telling you, they're destroyed if they don't know uh, uh, that that uh, that they have to walk in this gospel. Jesus said, many are going to say to me in that day, Lord, didn't we uh, prophesy in your name? You know, to... To prophesy in his name, that takes a pretty strong Christian to prophesy in his name. Uh, we heal the sick. We we cast out demons. They even raise the dead, it says. And, but see, see that there is never a time. I'm gonna I'm gonna set this to rest because, I mean, it's gonna cause sparks to fly all over Christianity. There will never be a time. And your salvation is past tense. There will never be a time. It's a hope. We covered that last week. It's a hope. And it's, you know, you walk in your hope until Jesus Christ is formed in you and you're born again into his image and his likeness. Now, just exactly like that newly conceived baby is a baby, so is that newly conceived Christian, a Christian. They have a seed that God puts in them. And we learned in the first teaching that I did, and I even brought it up in a later one, that it says give and it will be given into you. And so, and I made the statement, it's a shock statement. I have these, and see, when you don't have anything to protect, you don't, I, I don't, I don't have to take up an offering, so I don't worry about how small it's going to be. And so I I can say to you uh, that, you know, they, I can say these things without it causing me harm because I can speak the truth. And that's there's, there's one benefit to having nothing is you don't have anything to protect. And uh, and so, uh, you know, the, you know I, I said to you, there is no time ever that you, that, it becomes something you can point back and say, that's when I was saved. There will never be that time because it's it's a hope, a hope that, you know, of being born again into his image and likeness. In hope we've been saved and not a prayer or a, a, a walk into the aisle or coming down at, at a crusade. Now, you say, well, I mean, God changed my life there. Of course he did. That was when he put the seed in you, the seed of life. You know, eternal, the seed of eternal life was put into you. But I have to tell you, and this is my shock statement, you receive nothing from God unless you give it first. You receive nothing from God. That is the greatest revelation that I've ever seen in God's word, that, that give and it will be given unto you. Now, uh <clears throat> I said all that because I'm going to this scripture and uh, Luke 6. Let's 
Steve, I actually cannot open my laptop because it starts playing a commercial. I have no idea how these things, um, you know, I, you know, I, <laughs> I, it, we it's, just, had- it's so, what's that? We'll get it taken care of by next week somehow. All right. It's funny. I mean, it's just when you think about it, it's hilarious, you know, that that it would uh, decide to do it while I'm teaching. But that just shows you. I mean, I, oh, boy, I I know a lot more than I can say right now. So um, anyway, you have to watch that the powers of darkness doesn't use what you say. And, uh, 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 you know, and, and well-meaning people uh, become used to uh, discredit what God is doing. So um, now, you know, you know, I read off, you know, uh, you know, bless, you know, this is in Luke 6, you know, you know, and I, and I, I'm going to, I'm going to actually go to verse 35, but, but he says, bless those that curse you, pray for those who mistreat you, you know, someone strikes on the cheek, turn the other cheek, you know, he says, he says, do good, expecting nothing in return. He says, what credit is there if, uh, you know, if you love those that love you, I mean, you know, that's nothing. You do good to those that do good to you. What? That's that is that isn't anything. He he says that's not the gospel. The gospel is to do good that to those that don't love you. And I mean that is just wow, you know. So that's it's loving your neighbors yourself. It's even loving your enemies, which is even the, uh, the next step. But anyway, so anyway, he comes to verse thirty-five. He says, "But love your enemies." And do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be, and now look at this, Marcus, sons of the Most High. For he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Now you just think about that. For he, he says, I want you to do this because this is what I do. Now, you know, in a lot of my teachings, I refer back to the way God thinks. And I actually have told people, I've said, uh, uh, they say, how do you know that? I said, because I know how God thinks. And they get they get upset at me because they think that means I know what God's plan is and how he's going to do it. Not that me. It has nothing to do with that. It, it, ha- it has to do with how God thinks about this entire vision. And this is how he thinks, okay? He says, he says, I mean, I'm just making all this up. I mean, it's not something God, God didn't speak to me, tell me all this. He just shows it to me all over the Bible from cover to cover in Revelation. He made a decision that the way his kingdom was going to work is that the least is the greatest. Now, have you seen anywhere in Christianity to where it appears like the least is the greatest? Paul said the most seemly members of the body are the most important. Have you seen anywhere in the body where that is the case? And I mean, God just thinks different. And so he says, the least is the greatest. The last is first. He says, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. Have you seen anywhere where that is true in Christianity? I mean, we ought to be able, you know, and so I started going, you know, something's wrong. It, it, something's wrong. Nothing's lining up here. You know, I started seeing these things. I'm talking 30 some years ago. And I go, something is bad wrong. You know, the, the the greatest is the greatest that we see. The one that exalts himself is the mo- exalted. And, you know, and, and God's just, uh, he's blessing the socks off of the people that are full of pride, arrogance, and, and uh, selfishness. And, and, and I said, man, you know, something is wrong. And so, uh, anyway, uh, here we see, that I mean, he, everything with God is—it's either messed up, 
or we're messed up, folks, because he's not like us. He doesn't think like us. And we're not living in his kingdom because his kingdom's different. So he says, um, uh, if you do these things, your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. So he says, you want to be like me? This is what it's going to take. And this is my kingdom. And, you know, they all started leaving at one point. He said to the disciples, are you are you going to leave too? He didn't say, you know, I better change things because people are starting to leave. He said, are you going to leave too? In other words, you can leave if you want because this is the way it is. This is God's kingdom. And I'm here to show you what God's kingdom is really like. You guys got a bunch of religion. You're whitewashed tombs. And you go around studying the scriptures, memorizing scriptures, you know, uh, counting your steps every day that you walk and keeping the Sabbath. And you don't even know what the scriptures are about, which is me. And so, anyway, I'm... I'm sharing this, that what the Lord showed me is every one of those things in Luke 6. That, you know, he says, uh, uh, you know, he says, uh, uh, love your enemies, do good to those that hate you, bless those that curse you, pray for those that mistreat you, ones who want to hit you on the cheek, offer them the other. Every one of those things can be ended with that phrase, your reward will be great and you will be son to the Most High. And Steve and I are talking about that, and all of a sudden I said, you know, wouldn't it be something if there was an if in the other, usually when he teaches something, it's in another one of the Gospels also. And so while I was talking, you know, Steve's flipping around over here, and he finds it. And sure enough, there it was. And uh, so we're going over to uh, Matthew 5. Verse 44, Matthew 5, 44. It's always here, by the way. It's always here. We just can't see it yet. And uh, verse 44, but I say to you, it's Matthew 5, 44, love your enemies, pray for those who persecute you in order that. Now, Mark, in order that. Now, that may not be in the King James. I'm just saying, you know, it'll have something for you to mark, but in order that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven, for he causes his Son to rise on the evil and the good and send rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Now, if you love those, uh, for if you love those who love you, what reward have you? What's the reward? You'll be sons of the Most High, sons of the Father. And that he, uh, he says, uh, even the tax gatherers do that. He said, if you greet brothers only, what do you do more than others? Don't even the Gentiles do that? Therefore, you are to be perfect. Mark that word, perfect, as your Heavenly Father is perfect. So, <clears throat> My message to you today is, if you want to be sons of the Most High, if you want to be sons of the Father, if you want to be perfect in Christ, if you want to attain to the resurrection of the dead, if you want to be the fullness of Christ Jesus, if you want to fulfill the law and not be under the law, then you have to practice what Jesus practiced. He was an example, and it says for us to follow in his steps. So anyway, we can uh, we can see these things and how they're um, how they work. Uh, I'm going to mute this just for a moment here, Steve, and uh, I'll be right back because I'm going to try to solve this computer problem. Did that mute it? I hear you still. You can hear me. Oh, I pushed the pound yeah, to yeah. the stop. Yeah, if you turn down the volume on your computer, I'll bet you that'll that'll you know it'll still come up, but you won't hear it. 
So just turn down the volume on your computer, and I think you'll solve the problem for now anyway. Okay, I, I, it was turned all the way down, and it still does it. So anyway, we'll just hope here that it won't uh, come back and uh, torment us again. So okay, now, um, um, I want to go to uh, uh, Isaiah twenty nine, and uh, those of you who have the list. If you don't, why at the end of this uh, session, uh, give us. Uh, you know, uh, you know. Tell us, and we'll we'll get it sent to you, so that you can get it every week. You'll be on Nancy's mailing list, and you'll get an updated one every week. And uh, it'll change a lot every week. Um, okay, in Isaiah 29. Now, let's see if I can get there here. I mean, I've got it in front of me, but I, there's a reason why I go to it, because the Lord quickens things while I'm there, and uh, uh, so I, I like to, I like to be there uh, so I can see it in my Bible. And uh, by the way, I always say, people ask me, they say, why do you use a New American Standard? Well, that, the, the man that taught me how to study um, he used a New American Standard, so I got one so I could follow him, and and I got used to it. And uh, I grew up with the King James, and I, be honest with you, the King James is not my language. <laughs> my, my language, man. I came from Missouri, and uh, and in, in, in Missouri, you know, we didn't talk like that. And uh, and there's words in there like hitherto, and uh, yeah. can you hear me in in the, can every, you can hear me, right? Now. Okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Just want to make sure I hadn't goofed here. Um, so anyway, so I, I have to. Uh, uh, it's it's a, it, it was just important to me to have one in in my English. <laughs> I have enough trouble with with English without uh, without the King James English. But uh, anyway, it's a good translation, and I certainly don't. But I'm going to tell you something. It doesn't make any difference as long as it's, I mean, there's some diluted ones that are pretty bad. But uh, if it's, as long as it's a good translation, it's the Spirit of God that's going to teach you. And uh, he works through all that. But I can tell you, if your heart is not right, why, you can't, you can't uh, see it in any of it. Uh, it's all hidden. So anyway, here it is. It's, it's going to tell us here. This is 29 verse 9. Be Delayed and wait. Blind yourselves and be blind. They become drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with strong drink. For the Lord has poured over you a spirit of deep sleep. He has shut your eyes, the prophets. He has covered your head, the seers, and the entire vision. Mark, entire vision. Shall be to you like a, the words of a sealed book which when they give it to the one who is literate, saying, please read this, he'll say, I cannot, for it is sealed. <laughs> then the book will be given to the one who is illiterate, saying, please read this, and he'll say, I cannot read. Uh, I cannot read. Then the Lord said, because this people draw near with their words, mark words, <laughs> lots and lots of words, and honor me with their lip service, mark lip service but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of tradition. Mark, tradition. <laughs> and it's learned by rote. In other words, just doing it over and over again. Therefore, behold, I will once again deal marvelously with this people, wondrous with the marvelous, he calls it marvelous, and the wisdom of their wise men shall perish, and the discernment of their discerning men will be shall be concealed. And that is exactly what has happened today. And, you know, the Bible talks about a great falling away. 
folks, it has been us. We have been the great falling away. The apostate church of the last days, it has been us. Now, you know, I, I can tell you the truth because I don't have to protect anything. I mean, they'll just, I mean, they will scream when they hear me say this thing, but I'm sorry. I have to tell the truth. You know, the Bible says if, if a watchman sees the sword coming upon the people and he doesn't warn the people, he said their blood will be on his hands. That watchman, their blood is on the watchman's hands. But if he sees it and he warns the people, he delivers himself, the Bible says. But remember, it says all that's written in earlier times were written for our instruction. Now, I make it clear that what was written there, it it probably happened. I mean, not in every case, but, but it probably happened. But the thing is, it was written for our instruction. Now, I'm going to take it one step further. What was written in the New Testament was also written for our instruction. And there's much of the New Testament that is totally blinded. It's hidden. I mean, he says, warning, 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 warning. And, and we go, oh, that's not for us because we're already gone. Uh, we're we're, we're going to be... We're going to be taken out before all that happens. That is the doctrine of demons that is trying to keep you from reading what's in that scripture. That scripture is for you. Everything in that Bible is for you. If, it, if somebody says, no, that's, that's after we're gone. No, it is for you. It was written for you and me, and it applies to us. It's not out there someplace. When you see some big old war that's going to take place over in some valley in Israel, that is not, that has nothing to do with you if you're a spiritual person. It is written for that great war that's going to take place in you. Now, is that as clear as I can get it? I, I am not going to hide it and withhold anything profitable from the great congregation because of selfish motives and because I don't want to be attacked or criticized or something, I'm going to tell you the truth. I'll always tell you the truth. And anyway, that you say, well, I'm so glad we're not going to be here in the Great Tribulation. Folks, the Great Tribulation is probably going on right now in you. And it causes a great falling away because people don't know. They haven't been told because it's been sealed all these years. And, you know, all of a sudden he opens up. Oh, my goodness, there it is. And I've been searching for it for 30 years. And it's finally, it's finally here. So, anyway. Now, you know, while I'm here, look at Luke. I mean, I'm sorry. I'm Luke. I look at Isaiah 28. I mean, I mean, this will just show you what an example of this darkness has slipped over us. And, uh, um, uh, you know, in Isaiah 28, verse 9, it says, I, I shared this the first time, uh, first get-together we had, and, it, and it, it wasn't on tape at that time. But it says, to whom would he teach knowledge? This is Isaiah 28, verse 9. To whom would he teach knowledge? To whom would he interpret the message? Now, you might want to work that, uh, circle that word, interpret, because I have a whole lot to share on that, but I got I can't take you there yet. But because uh, interpretation of the mysteries is a very important part of what we're seeing. So, okay, uh, those just wean from milk. Uh, those uh, just taken from the breast, for he says, now look at this, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there, indeed. Now look at this. See, you say, well, yeah, yeah, that's 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 the way we teach. That's the way we preach, order on order, order on order, line on line, line on line, a little here, a little there. Indeed, he will speak to this people through stammering lips as parables, 
and a foreign tongue, that's parables, he who said to them, here is rest, give rest to the weary. Here is repose, but they would not listen. Circle would not listen. So the word of the Lord to them will be, order on order. Oh, my. Order on order. Line on line, line on line. A little here, a little there. That they may go and stumble backward, be broken, snared, and taken captive. Verse 14, therefore hear the word of the Lord, O scoffers, who rule this people who are in Jerusalem, because they have said, we have made a covenant with death. Circle that, covenant with death. That's what they're saying. I already have it. I made a covenant with death, and I, I'm going to have it forever. I have it. And... They are being deceived because they've been told a lie. Okay, so order on order, order on order, line on line, line, you know, precept upon precept in the King James. That is how he deceives people, people who will not obey his word. the, The term really is his voice, obey his voice. And... See, over there in in Exodus, you know, they, you know, um, God told Moses, he said, tell the people to come out to the mountain. And, uh, and you know, the, when they came, well, there was thunder, lightning, all these things represent something, but I don't have time to go into them. But thunder and lightning and shaking, the mountain shook and scared the people. They were scared of God. And they backed off and they said, uh, uh, oh, it said there's like a loud trumpet that kept getting louder and louder, just blasting. And, and that's exactly what you're hearing. Um, you're hearing lightning, thunder, and, and there's a shake. I'm, I'm shaking you with the truth, with his voice. And uh, people will back up and go, whoa, wait, wait a minute. Whoa, whoa, this is this is a new, we didn't know we got into this, uh, you know. I mean, hey, the flesh pots of Egypt weren't all that bad. I mean, at least we were dead. And, uh, you know, I mean, at least we didn't, we're now here in this place with him. I mean, God, I mean, he's, he's not like what we thought. I mean, I, I thought it just meant I had to go to church every Sunday. Uh, I, I didn't know I have to uh, die every day, die daily, and I, and I didn't know I have to turn the other cheek with my enemy. I didn't know I have to love those kind of people. I didn't know I have to give to every woman. I, did, I didn't know. And uh, he says, well, so the word to you is going to be order on order. <laughs> and I, I'm going to give you something to practice for the rest of your life so that you'll be snared, uh, you know, you, you'll you stumble backward, be broken, snared, and taken captive. And that's exactly what has happened. And right in the midst of the congregation. Now, you say, well, you know, isn't this the church? Sure it is, you know. And remember, there was two kind of virgins, weren't they? You know, there, there was a, uh, you know, they and they were all waiting. I mean, uh, but, you know, uh, at the ten virgins, you know, uh, five got in and five didn't. And uh, so, you know, just being one of the virgins was not enough. And uh, and so it is today. Now, just remember that the Bible says that uh, we are, uh, um, um, I lost my train of thought, I was, um, but anyway, the, uh, uh, the oh, I know what it was. The wheat and the tares. Uh, he said, "You know, we're checking." Jesus said, "You know, we're checking, and there's tares in this crop." Now, like I shared with you before, um, and you know, 
a guy that knew a lot about farming told me, he, I said, uh, well, that's, you know, good-looking wheat. And he said, yeah, as long as it's not tares. And I looked at him and I said, what do you mean? I thought tares were weeds. He said, oh, no. Tares are, they look exactly the same. They just don't have any fruit in them. I went, oh, my gosh. What in the world was that? I, I didn't, never heard that before. Anyway, just remember the tares and the wheat are growing together. They both look the same, folks. You can't, matter of fact, God says let them remain together until the harvest. Um, now, the harvest is taking place every day. And, um, you know, it's not some time out there in the sweet by and by. It was written for you. The reapers come and they they come to harvest. When someone offends you, that is the reapers in that person coming to test your fruit. And Jesus said, you have to bless those that curse you. You have to pray for those that mistreat you because that's the reapers coming, searching for the harvest. And that's why the book of Revelation, you know, I'm, I'm going to take a, a bold step here. I don't think there's anything in the book of Revelation that's future. Now, that's a bold statement. Now, there might be, but he hasn't shown me that yet. He doesn't show me much of the natural. I mean, that's just not something that I, I dwell on. But I don't think there's anything there. I think it's all taking place in you. And he hides it. He hides it order on order, line on line, a little here, a little there, that, that they can be snared and taken captive, fall backwards and destroyed and because they will not turn their hearts to him, you know, he said that, you know, their reverence for him becomes as tradition. And so he said, I seal it up to them and I give them something to study for the rest of their lives. And, and I mean, they are, they're teaching in the seminaries. They're rolling them out one after the other to teach these doctrines and these traditions. And, and, and people are just not, and I mean, they're good people. They're good people. They're they're nice people. But see, so were some of the Pharisees too. But they still, he said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of God. And so, anyway, um, so I'm just trying to I'm trying to open your eyes to something here now. Uh, I'm not going to turn there, but I, well, I am, because there's something else I want to cover. Turn to Daniel. To where? Daniel. Book of Daniel. That book, man, I, if you knew the, uh, uh, the, what I have labored to, to understand that book, but um, anyway, um, but I've got things all over it now. It just keeps little by little. I keep uh, uh, getting stuff out. But this is in Daniel 12. Uh, I'm going to read, but then I'm going to point out a few things in it. In Daniel 12, uh, verse 4 is what we're going to do first. He says, "But as for you, Daniel." Conceal these words and seal up the book until the end of time. Many will go back and forth, circle back and forth. That's a, wow. And knowledge will increase. You know, you can go back and forth um, on whether you're walking in faith or not. And, uh, uh, I always make it clear, there is absolute security in God for believers. Absolute security. The security of the believer is a legitimate teaching in that Bible. 
But don't ever think that your security becomes a license for you to go back and turn your back on God and walk in your own nature and not be, he's going to, He's going to try to correct you, then he's going to try to correct you again, and then he'll let the deluding influence come in, and you'll be destroyed. And you will always think, you know, I'll, I, I, you know, I always say, you know, Satan says, I can take him from here, God. He's mine now. And he takes over, and he seats himself in the temple of God, displaying himself as being God, and he leads you to the, the rest of your life. And you will thank God and bless God and pray to God and worship God and dance before God and sing continually and still totally miss him because your heart turned away from him. And that is the absolute truth. Now, okay, we're going to read verse 9. And he said, go your way, Daniel, for for these words are concealed, concealed up until the end time. So this gospel of the kingdom is sealed, and it's in parables, it's in mysteries, it's in dark sayings, it's in proverbs. And the entire book of Proverbs is a is parables. It's the whole. That's what it means is parables. And you know when Jesus came, he spoke in parables, and they go. What what are you doing? What what? I mean, Jesus, they're here to listen. Tell them, and he says, uh, I I can't unless they return and be forgiven. I, I can't. They can't hear me. I have to speak to them in parables, and that's exactly the way it's been since Genesis one one. He speaks in parables, and he reveals it to those who are his baby disciples. Now, I'm going to point a few things out in Daniel real quick. Um, now, I know this is uh, this is going to be quite uh, jarring to some people, but uh, um, I'm going to go to Daniel 7. Um, now, you say, you know, what about all these beasts and all these things, you know, and, uh, you know, this beast was the Roman Empire, and this beast was the Persian Empire. You know, it, it probably was. It probably was. It has nothing to do with me. I'm not a natural man. I'm a spiritual man. And a spiritual man listens for spiritual words. That's the revealing of the parables. And most things in the Bible happened, but they were recorded, what's it say, in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 6 and verse 11, it says 1 Corinthians 10, 6 and 11, There's, it also says Romans 15, it says all that was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. It happened for them, but it's recorded for us. So you, people get, they read Genesis and they a natural man will only see the natural, and he'll spend his whole life arguing about the creation and all that. It has absolutely nothing to me. People say, what do you think about this? I, I don't know. God hadn't shown me yet. And well, sure, you have an opinion. Oh, well, yeah, I got lots of those, but, but what do you want that for? You know, I mean, I mean, when God gives you something, it's yours. It's, it's not the same as an opinion. And... Uh, Anyway, um, now we're going to, in Daniel 7, uh, oh, I don't know, we'll look at verse uh, 21, we'll say. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Now, this is written for us, folks. Now, there's a horn, whatever it represents, and, you know, God hadn't shown me that horn yet. I don't, I don't. I don't know what it is. It doesn't matter. It, it's overpowered them. And the ancient of days came, and judgment was passed. There it is. Mark judgment is passed. In favor of the saints of the Most High, and the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. 
So we're looking for the saints to take possession of the kingdom. Now, you could take possession of the kingdom at any time. If you were born in 1642, you could take possession of this kingdom. When the when the uh, the, uh, the ancient of days comes, that's mark that word came. I mean that's that's the coming in you. And uh, now you say, well, Dennis, couldn't there be a time in history? Probably. I, I mean, I, I'm not doubting that. The problem is that's not what I'm about. What I'm about is what God's showing me. And what God's showing me is that coming he is he's coming whether you're he's coming in you or not he's coming he says i'll either come as a thief or i'll come in you in the fullness of all in all you know and one of the two he's coming and uh, you know the one who comes as a thief is jesus christ he comes to see if he can take your crown now your crown is not some gold thing that sits on top of your head it's a crown of righteousness. It's a crown of of kindness and gentleness and patience and mercy. And I, I can show you that right in the Bible. I don't have time to go there right now, but but he's he's gonna he says, I have to test you to see what's in your heart. I have to test you to see if you'll keep my commandments or not. I have to test you and see if you will stand. I have to test you and see if you will remain. I have to test you and see if you will endure to the end. And the one that endures to the end will be what? Saved. I say, well, well, wait a second. I read this book, and it says that's after we're gone, and we're going to be raptured out of here, and it's, none of that applies to us. That's a doctrine of demons, and it is strangling you. It's causing you to be snared, taken captive, and fall backward, and all of that stuff, just like you said. So, uh, okay. So the saints take possession of the kingdom, and, you know, I'm going to give you an opinion. Okay, I always, always tell you the difference. There's things I know, and then there's opinions. It doesn't mean my opinion is wrong. It just means that that's all it is. All of those beasts are in you. All of them represent something that Jesus taught and they're taking place in you. Okay, verse 25. And he will speak out against the Most High. Oh, he absolutely does. That's the beast. Okay, and all of these are... In Revelation, you know, the beast, he's going to speak out against the Most High, and he's going to what? Wear down the saints of the Most High. Oh, he sure is. And he will intend to make alterations in times and in law. He sure does. His alteration is that you don't have to obey the true law, which is the royal law, which is to love your neighbor as yourself. In other words, fulfill the gospel and so uh, and they will be given into his hand you see that we will be given into his hand for a time and I that's the great falling away which is all over this Bible they were falling away from the very first of Genesis they started falling away and the great falling away is still going on today the great falling away is in his People. It's anyone who comes to the Lord in faith and then refuses to obey his voice, the falling away takes place. So, uh, uh, but the court will set for judgment and his dominion will be taken away. Oh, yeah, okay. All right, so then the sovereignty, the dominion, and the greatness of all the kingdoms will, under the whole heaven, will be given to the people of the saints of the highest one. His kingdom will be everlasting kingdom, and all the dominions will serve and obey him. So now, uh, I mean, the reason this is so important is, see, that judgment, uh, you know, 
the court will set in judgment. That judgment is taking place in you. See, there's two kinds of judgments. You can you can judge people uh, uh, with unrighteous judgment, or you can judge people with righteous judgment. Now, see, righteous judgment is when I bless those that curse me. See, that's righteous judgment. Unrighteous judgment is when I get angry at those that curse me. See, that's unrighteous judgment. And uh, and so righteous judgment, it we become a living sacrifice when we perform righteous judgment. So that's why the righteous judgment causes us to take possession of the kingdom of the highest one, and it'll be an everlasting kingdom. Why is it everlasting? Because you give, and it'll be given unto you, pressed down, shaken together, running over, you know, pour into your lap. So this is this is so big to know because that's why, that's how you remain. That's how you stand because the more you give by your standard of measure, it will be given to you. And you say, well, what will be given to me? Exactly what you give by your standard of measure, it will be given. You said, you say, oh, God, pour out your blessings on me. He says, well, wait a second. You, you didn't understand my gospel. I said, give, and it will be given unto you. I said, by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you. You say, oh, God, please forgive me of my sins. He says, wait a minute. I said, pardon, and you'll be pardoned. I said, forgive, and you will be forgiven. Matter of fact, I even said, by your standard of measure, it will be given. And he says, but beware, judge, and you'll be judged. Condemn, and you'll be condemned. I am convinced God never judges anyone, ever. You say, wait a second, I can show you all over the Bible. I'm convinced God never sends his wrath on anyone. You bring it on yourself by what you sow. You give wrath, you get wrath. You give judgment, you get judgment. You give condemnation, you get condemnation. Now, yes, God set up the laws, and he does say all over that he sends it. But I now, but I I have seen it over and over and over in the Bible that he doesn't send it. You send it. And I can tell you what we have in the, in the heavenlies at the end when we're gone will be exactly what we have sown. He says, matter of fact, you're going to render account for every careless word that comes out of your mouth because that is exactly what was in your heart. And so, anyway, now, uh, I'm going to read a couple more of these while we're over here. Uh, There's really a number of them. And I was uh, um, Okay, we're in uh, Daniel 11. Daniel 11. I say, my gosh, he teaches over in these places I haven't been in 20 years. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing right now. Uh, uh, now, verse 11. Uh, this is Daniel 11, verse 11. And the king of the south will be enraged and go forth and fight no, yeah, with the king of the north. And you say, well, what's all that? I, I don't know. I, I haven't even been interested in it. I mean, if you think the, uh, the army of the north is Russia coming down on Israel, you know what? It probably will be. It, you know, it probably will be. Because I, that's kind of the way God works. He does something unnatural for the natural man. A man that's never been born of the Spirit, just teaching tradition. So he he probably will. He, matter of fact, he'll probably uh, build a temple again. And uh, 
I always thought it was interesting over in the Old Testament, you know, and David said, I, I want to build a house for your name. He said, how are you going to do that? You know, and, and so he, he explains to him, you know, I, I don't dwell in the houses made with hands, and then he turns around and lets David do it. <laughs> but anyway, that's that's fine. I mean, he, he always does that. He, he he does it in the natural for natural people. And uh, But anyway, I don't uh, – the army in the north – is uh, the powers of darkness coming upon Jerusalem, which is God's people, and and uh, uh, you know, uh, you know, he says, not all, you know, Paul says, not all Israel descended from Israel, <laughs> you know. But anyway, I don't have time to go into that. It just become a stumbling block, and but anyway, one day maybe. Uh, so the king of the south will. Uh, will be enraged and go uh, forth and fight with the king of the north. Then the latter will raise up a great multitude, but that multitude will be given into the hand of the former. Do you see that? It's going to be given into the hand, okay? When the multitude is carried away, his heart will be lifted up, and he will cause tens of thousands to fall. That's exactly what takes place, a great falling away. And uh, now go down to verse 15. Verse 15, then the king of the north will come, cast up a siege mound, and capture a well-fortified city, and the forces of the south will not stand their ground. Mark, not stand their ground. And you're going to see that word stand, and it's all over the New Testament. You know, stand firm. You know, he, he, you know uh, when you've done all the stand, stand, you know. And, you know, it's uh, – anyway, I – I mean, this is this is written for our instruction. So you know, they they will not stand their ground, and even their choicest troops or their choicest warriors will not be able to stand, for there will be no strength to make a stand. And um, uh, anyway, but he who comes against him will do as he pleases, and no one will be able to withstand him. He will also stay for a time in the beautiful land. That is right in your heart with destruction in his hand. Okay, so we have um, – um, so we can see all of this was prophesied, what would take place, and uh, and it's taken place. Uh, in us even while we sit on the pew. So um, now I'm going to go down and look here. There's um, I want to move ahead a ways here. But these are some things that, as the Lord gives them to me, I want to share with you. Do you feel that I have warned you properly? When I saw the sword coming and I warned the people, I have tried with all I have to warn the people that, they are being led away by deceiving spirits and taught doctrines of demons. Paul said, you know, I'm afraid that you've received a different gospel. He says, brought about by a different spirit. See, the beast has his own um, his own body too. That's those that have a heart for him, which is the works of uh, the flesh and the uh, works of darkness. And uh, uh, so, okay, I'm going to, uh, there's something I want to point out. Uh, in the, in Webster's 1828 dictionary, um, you know, that dictionary was really based on Bible uh, words and, uh, uh, you can find a lot of really great things in it, and uh, I have actually two of them, uh, but they're in storage right now. But 
Uh, and of course, it's all on the internet now. You don't have to have all those big old things. But uh, anyway, it says that uh, in Scripture, it means hate means to love someone less than yourself. It says in scriptural terms, it means it signifies to love someone less than yourself. So you say, well, I don't hate anybody. And uh, But if you love someone less than yourself, then you, are, uh, you hate them in God's view. And it doesn't matter what it means to the world. It means what it means. Uh, in God's view. Now we're going to go to First uh, John. I have uh, all week the Lord has been um, talking to me out of First John. Now, First John is my favorite book, and uh, um, I had three major revelations out of First John. And I mean, if ever there's a, something that's so marked up, I can hardly read my Bible, it's First John. Now, there's things in First John that are um, very important to point out. So now I'm just going to, I'm just going to touch something here at the very first. First John 1, First John 1. One. This is first one. What was from the beginning? Mark the beginning. And I don't honestly know what the beginning was, but I know whatever we're going to talk about here was from the beginning. And I know the whole book of First John is about what was from the beginning. And uh, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have beheld and our hands handled concerning the word of life. Now, has he used the name Jesus or Jesus Christ anywhere yet? He hasn't, has he? He hasn't said anything about him. And the life was manifested. Still hasn't used his name. And we studied the name in one of our uh, get-togethers, because, uh, you know, he said, uh, you know, Father, you gave me the name. And he said, I, I gave it to them. <laughs> well, it wasn't. See, that's what I mean, everything. That there's there's two crosses. There's two Jesuses. There's two bodies. There's two churches. There's two everything. And you gotta know which one he's talking about. But anyway, he says he says, We seen it with our eyes. We beheld it. That word beheld is important too, by the way. And our hands handled it. We we actually reached out and touched the word of life. I just think about that, you know. See the word of the life is life itself. And this life itself came from the Father and it was manifested on this earth. And he said, we saw it, we beheld it, and we actually touched life. I just think about that. You know, you say, well, you know, don't you believe in Jesus? Absolutely. I mean, he was the son of God, but he was so much more. He was the life of God. And the life was manifested. That's important. And, you know, it, you know when uh, it's so funny when uh, uh, John the Baptist saw him, it says, and he saw him as he walked. I circled as he he walked. He said, well, you know, he was just walking along the bank of the river. Okay. For a natural man, that's good enough. But for a spiritual man, he knows what walking means. And I can tell you, he, the life was manifested. That means he walked. And we have seen and bear witness 
bear witness means something too, and you can circle that because we've talked about that, and we will more again. And proclaim to you the eternal life. Do you see that? Circle the eternal life. He says, we saw eternal life. See, eternal life is a living thing. You think, well, yeah, I guess it would be. Oh, no, I'm talking deep stuff now, you know. We're talking spiritual things to spiritual men that can hear, have spiritual ears. Eternal life is a living thing, and it was in him. It be, it became him because he sowed it, and he walked in it, and it came back, pressed him down, shaken together, running over it, poured into his lap, until he was the fullness of God, all in all, in in a living carton, you know, a body, okay? Uh, okay, which was with the Father and was manifested with us. And, I mean, it is the heart, the very life of the Father, and he said, we actually got to see it. Now, okay, now... Um, Verse 5, and this is the message we have heard from him, and we announce to you that God is light. Now, remember I told you, life and light and love are really all the same thing. You know, life is what was in the Father. When life is manifested, it's referred to as light. So it's the light of the world. See, the light of the world is Jesus, you know, and the light is the life of God manifested, okay? Uh, and then love is the is us manifesting it to others. It is expressed through love. I, you know, if you have ears to hear, you can hear that. Uh, one of the hardest things is I've actually had people sit night after night after night after night and say to me, I don't have a clue what you're talking about. And I said, I'm so sorry. I I wish I could help you, but I, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing I can do. I can't open eyes. I can only proclaim it. I can only sound forth in my life and my walk and, and the gospel. And I can't open people's eyes to it. And you know what? <laughs> Jesus didn't either. He couldn't. Uh, it's just, I, I don't know how to explain. The Holy Spirit decides these things. He searches the intent of their heart, and there's something there, and who am I? I, I can't point and say, you know, you, you've got something wrong with you. I, I can't do that. I can only, I can only spread the seed. Uh, seed falls on different types of ground, and I, you know, uh, I, I can't I can't do nothing about their ground. I, I can't do it. So uh, anyway, um, and I get to I get to reaching out there and and teaching, and I I uh, have to get back to where I am. So so God is light. This is verse five. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. If we say, Mark, say now. Remember, it's the fruit of our lips. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness. Now, we say, I'm a Christian. I love God. I I love the Bible. I, you know, I worship him. I praise him. I adore him. It says, yet walk in darkness. We lie. And we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and here's what happens. The blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Now, you say, well, yeah, I already already got that. He died for me on the cross. Yes, he died for the sins of the whole world. But is the whole world saved? 
No, the whole world is not saved. Why? He died for the sins of the whole world. He purchased them with his own blood. Why aren't they saved? Because they have not been born again into the image and likeness of God. If we say we have fellowship, in other words, we're in him, we are one with him, we are saved by him, and we yet walk in darkness, we're lying and we're not practicing the truth. In other words, we're not practicing his command to love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which is loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving the Lord, he said, I love the Lord with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said, that is yet to be tested. I'm going to come upon you as a thief, and I'm going to find out. That's your lips saying that. If we say we have fellowship, if we say we belong to him, he says, I I will find that out yet. That is yet to be discovered. That's what you think in your mind, but your heart may say something totally different. Okay, so, but if we walk in the light, as he himself is the light, we have fellowship with one another. That's important too. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. So the blood of Jesus cleanses us if we, Mark, walk in the light. That's when... Matter of fact, that was the whole teaching that I started out in the beginning is we're sanctified by the offering of sacrifices and offerings. We're, that's what we're sanctified by. As we obey Jesus Christ, we are sprinkled in his blood and we are sanctified and we are shaped and formed in his image and his likeness. If we say we have no sin... We are deceiving ourselves, at, you know, of course the whole subject is uh, walking in darkness. If we say we have no sin, and I put, and walk in darkness, uh, we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is fa- faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and Anyway, if we say we have not sinned, and of course, yet walk in darkness, that's the whole subject here, uh, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Uh, so, now, this is this is important stuff to get out there to the people in the church. We never point the finger. Never point the finger. You say, well, Jesus kind of did, and Paul kind of did. I said, I'm sorry. I'm not Jesus, and I'm not Paul. I cannot point the finger. I can speak the truth in general, but we never condemn uh, someone else. We just uh, uh, try to speak the truth to them and love. Remember that, you know, we're love is you know the gospel is a it's a uh, a stumbling block to the Jew and it's foolishness to um, to the Gentile. What that means is you know that you when you walk in the gospel and you tell someone this is how you have to walk if you're of Jesus Christ. A Jew, see, a Jew is anyone who believes they belong to God. You say, wait a minute, Dennis, don't you, don't you believe there's a, a natural Jew? Of course I do. That's not where I'm at. I'm, I'm a spiritual man, and I, I'm seeing spiritual things given by the Holy Spirit, and I have to teach according to what is given me. I don't teach about the natural Jew. That's somebody else's. He says, he says, haven't you even seen where Moses is read in the in the synagogue ever ever Sabbath? I mean, that's already been being taught. And I'm teaching spiritual things for spiritual people with spiritual ears. And so, anyway, so the the uh, the important thing is that. That, uh, that we talk about 
who the spiritual Jew is because if we don't see that, why then we're really uh, we're really in trouble. And uh, uh, you know, I'm trying to think whether I want to go to it or not. You know, there's you know Paul says not all Israel descended from Israel. I mean that's an interesting statement. He said there's a new creation which is the Israel of God. Oh wow. See everything was a shadow. Yes, there is the natural, but everything's a shadow. And uh, uh hold your finger there and go to Galatians. I'm not just giving you opinions. I mean, this is the stuff I know. Now, sometimes I do tell you an opinion, but uh, now uh, we're going we're going to go to Galatians four, verse twenty-two. Galatians four twenty-two. For it is written that Abraham had two sons. Say, don't you believe Abraham had two sons? Of course I do. Of course. That's the natural. One by the bondwoman and one by the free woman. But the son by the bondwoman was born according to the flesh. And the son by the free woman through the promise. Now, look at the next sentence. This is allegorically speaking. Now, let's stop right there for a minute. He says, remember what was written in earlier times was written for our instruction. And uh, he said there's two kinds of women out here that we're talking about. He says uh, uh, the son from the bondwoman, that was Hagar, was born according to the flesh. Uh, And the son by the freeman was born according to the promise. Now, what was the promise? Now, Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. I can tell you this, Abraham was not righteous yet. Now, God may refer to him as being righteous, but that righteousness had not been completed yet. It had not been made perfect yet. And he had to go through all kinds of things. He went through famine. He went through trials. He went through tests until that was perfected in the fullness of him. And then Abraham was the man, the righteous man of God. And uh, now Abraham got tested. He says, you know, wait a second now. Let's see here. There's, he said a son would come from my home my own body. And that son, and, you know, obviously it can't be from Sarah because she can't have children. So, uh, you know, uh, if I had, you know, Sarah's the one that actually said it, but if I had a son through Hagar, that would still be a son and I would have the promise. Folks, we have a promise. He has promised us in the gospel to give us a son. I mean, we're a bride, and we're supposed to bring forth a son also. That son is the image and likeness of God. And we get to say, you know, we get to say, you know, I could have a son, and he could be, I mean, really would be, and I could bring forth an image, and I could bring forth a likeness, and I mean, as long as it, uh, that image, worship God, love God, praise God, pray to God. Uh, hey, I'll even go to church on Easter Sunday morning before daylight. You know, I mean, you know, see, that's how these things are written. Anyway, he says they're allegorically speaking. Uh, yes, but, uh, everything is allegorically speaking. Everything in that Bible is allegorically speaking with few exceptions. For those women are two covenants. One proceeded out of Mount Sinai bearing children who are to be slaves. She is Hagar. Now watch this. 
you talk about somebody that has a, a, a problem spiritualizing things. Now, this Hagar is Mount Sinai. Oh, that's interesting. I can tell you, Mount Hagar wasn't at Mount Sinai. And uh, it says in Arabia, and corresponds, look at this. Oh, man. Ooh, this is a hard one. To the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. Oh, my, 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 my. But the Jerusalem above, see, the real Jerusalem is above. Mark that above. It's free. She is our mother. Oh, my goodness. You know what he said there? He said, the people in Jerusalem are descendants of Hagar, allegorically speaking. For spiritual men with spiritual ears, their spiritual words. Anyway, he says, for it is written, Rejoice, barren woman who does not bear. Break forth and shout, you who are not in labor. For more, right, circle more, are the children of the desolate than of the one who has a husband. Mark, husband. <laughs> Whoa. So we have a husband, don't we? Okay, and you, brethren, like Isaac, are children of promise. Oh, wow. I mean, we're, we're children of the promise. But as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the spirit. And so it is now also. And folks, I can tell you, it's exactly what happens. When you become a child of the promise, Go back to First John 2. You become a child of the promise. He begins to, uh, to uh, I mean, these people begin to attack you and persecute you. You say, well, you know what? I mean, if we'd been alive back then, we'd have been persecuted too. No, you wouldn't. You're persecuted if you walk in the gospel. If you're not being persecuted, you're not being slandered and attacked and criticized and I mean, I actually had somebody that I looked to up to the most look me in the eye and say, there's nothing you have to say that's of any benefit to the body of Christ. That is exactly what they think because they they can't see these things and God hides them. And uh, anyway, I, uh, you know, that's why you can't have anything to defend this gospel Trying to have something to defend gets you in big trouble because you can't you can't speak the truth. Okay, we're in First John two, verse three. First John two, verse three. And by this we know we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Not, you know, he said his commandments are not burdensome. They're really not. When once you understand that you're, everyone is enslaved. Everyone is a slave. Everyone. You're either enslaved to your old nature, which is is uh, controlling you and destroying you, or you're enslaved to his nature. And his nature is not burdensome. It's actually a place of peace once you get there to be able to walk in his gospel. So... <clears throat> Anyway, the one who says, Mark says, I have come to know him, oh, to know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, Mark keeps his word. That's real important. In him, the love, Mark, love, love of God, love has truly been perfected. And that's what this is all about. We have to be made perfect. Jesus from his own lips says, be perfect as your heavenly father is perfect. Do you realize he didn't even, he wouldn't even say he was perfect. I mean, see, one of these days I'm going to teach on the son of God and the son of man, but I just, I can't quite do it yet. And uh, and so we're, we're kind of waiting, but, but see the, 
you know, the, he would not even call himself the son of God. He finally did a little bit over uh, when he was standing before uh, Pilate, I believe it was. And, uh, uh, but he would not. See, he wouldn't take anything to himself. You know, the Father says, I'm going to give you all things. The throne is yours. Everything I'm giving to you. Because you're my likeness and my image. And he says, I only delight to do thy will, O God. That is the humble, meek spirit that he's looking for. See, when you grab your salvation, you say, now I got it. I can never lose it. You, even God can't take it away from me. There's trouble down that road. And uh, so the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. The one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk. Circle that word walk. In the same manner. The same manner. The same Manner as he walked. This is so critical. You know, please don't ever take my my loud talk or my clear, blunt talk as being uh, anything other than love because I'm trying to wake up a people. God has given me this task, and, and it's been on me for so long, and I finally gave up that, that nobody was going to hear it. And uh, but he's now saying, go blow the trumpet again, go tell them. And uh, something's changed, and I'm not really exactly sure why. So now, I want to go over to verse 15. Well, I'm going to back up to 14. I have written to you, fathers, because you know him. Circle that word, know him. Who have been, who has been from the beginning. Isn't that interesting? From the beginning. Now, we're still talking about the same thing, right? I have written to you, young men, because you are strong, and the word of God abides in you. That's real important. Word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. The way we do battle is through the gospel. The gospel is the weapons of our warfare. The gospel is our armor of God. It's the breastplate that protects our vital parts, which is the heart. And so when we walk in the gospel, why we are, you say, well, don't you think? You know, of course I do. But we're spiritual men, and we're talking spiritual things for people with spiritual ears. And so, anyway, the uh, we overbecome the evil one because we have the helmet of salvation, which is God, uh, God working in us through his gospel. We have the breastplate of righteousness, which is we're doing the righteous acts of the faith, and so the righteous acts of God are being performed in us. That's how we also do war. We overcome the evil one by obeying his word. And uh, okay. Uh, verse 15. Do not love the world nor the things in the world. This is really the scripture I was coming to. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Do you see that? I'm going to read it again. Do not, do not love the world, nor the things, mark things in the world. If anyone loves the world, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not, is not, is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lust. 
but the one who does the will, Mark does the will of God, abides forever. Because why? Because he keeps sowing life. And as long as he sows life, he is safe. He is protected. He is has security. And he will not fall away. Therefore, he is completely safe in Christ. So anyway, now, there's, I want to speak to some. You know, Paul teaches us that all things are lawful. You, you realize how, you know, the word all is, is quite an amazing word when you think about it. It's so tiny, but it has such great, it's like if, <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, it has great meaning in a word like all. All things are profitable. I mean, I'm sorry, all things are <laughs> lawful. Now, so when you look out there at the world, all things are lawful. Now, immorality is not lawful. We know that. I mean, you know, God spoke to that. But but when you, but you know, things, all things are lawful. And, you know, I mean, he talks about, you know, uh, you know, they were talking about eating meat that had been sacrificed there in Corinth to the, to the, uh, to, to idols. And he says, don't worry about it. I have no concern. He says, because all things are lawful. He says, but not all things are profitable. And so when you're talking about love in the world, uh, you know, if somebody says to me, Dennis, I, I've got this uh, Corvette. It's red. Matter of fact, red Corvette. And uh, do you think that's the world? You know what my answer to them is? All things are lawful. I, I, there's no law against against it. You say, Dennis, I have uh, season tickets to, uh, I don't know, the Dallas Cowboys or the New England Patriots. Do you think that's uh, love in the world? All things are lawful, even even if it's the team you don't like. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. But all things are lawful. But not all things are profitable. But it says, but if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. Now, what's the difference? Okay, it's the heart. You say, see, have you ever noticed that it's never in our heart? It's always, you know, he loves that, but I, I don't. You know, I mean, that's the way we think, you know. I mean, that's the way we reason and, you know. You know, Paul said we compare ourselves among ourselves and we measure ourselves against ourselves. And when we do, we don't have understanding because, you know, as if we're the standard, you know, to measure ourselves with against us, you know. And so uh, if it, your conscience, and there's a whole lot in there for you to read about conscience, and it just keeps growing. I just keep finding more and more and more and more. Yeah, I didn't bring any of my teachings into this. This is all new stuff that God's given me as I'm, I mean, it's it's the old stuff that he's as he gives it to me again. I'm building this package for you of what I see as the vision, the vision that God wants to give to you. And uh, so now the difference is in the heart. The best way to know is if someone touches it, and uh, if someone touches, if someone touches that. And something rises up in you, which would be anger, resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, jealousy, criticism, slander, you know, who knows? There's a whole list. Then it was an idol, and it is the world. That's how you know. And he says if someone takes your cloak, give them your outer garment also. Why? Because it wasn't in your heart. And that's how you know. So anyway, I'm just saying to you, I will never point and say, that's the world, 
And if you have that, the love of the Father is not into you because it's not my place. It's God's, that's the spirit of God in you. And he, everybody, it's each to their own order. It's, uh, you know, that's in 1 Corinthians 15, each to their own order. He's going to convict you of something at a totally different time. That's why we don't judge one another. We encourage one another, and which is a totally different than judging. So anyway, so the one that does the will of God abides forever. Now, so anyway, I've got I got through what I wanted to cover there. Now, I want to remind you um, that. Uh, you know, he says, don't let, um, oh boy, let's see. Don't let any of you become like Esau, who sold his birthright for a single meal. Do you know, when you are given the seed, that's the way I'm going to teach it from now on is, you come to the Lord, there's conviction. He's reaching out, Spirit of God, reaching out to you. You come to the Lord, he gives you the seed. He says, everything you need, the, everything that pertains to life and godliness is in that seed, everything. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, he will make you a full baby, a mature baby perfect baby you will be his image and his likeness just like that little you know uh, baby that was just conceived in a woman well that is what God is doing that's exactly where you stand when that seed is planted and it's going to need a lot of nurturing it's going to need a lot to come into the fullness and be born again it's being born again. It'll be referred to as born again because he hides it. Why? Because he only reveals it to people as their heart changes. And they're only born again into his image and his likeness as, his, as their heart changes. So now I call that a birthright. That's, that's a birth. It's a, it's, a, it's a right to be born again. It was given to you as long as you walk in the gospel and be led by the Spirit of God. We study there's a witness you have to have. You have the witness of the water, which is the washing of the Word of God. And we actually wash each other by the life, which is the Word of life. When when I when out of me comes the Word of life, I'm washing you. When out of you comes the Word of life, it's washing me. We have to be born of the water. And then we have to be born... Uh, uh, you know we have we have to have the the uh, the witness of uh, uh, see the fire. You know the uh, you know he says baptized in the spirit and the fire. The fire is we have to be tested. We have to have the witness of the testings. We have to come off victorious from the beast. We have to have be, be able, so we have to have the witness. Uh, in us of the testing and trials, and that's the blood, okay? So there's the water, there's the blood, and the spirit. You know, all this is, is in First John, and uh, 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 I'll just uh, tell you where it's at so you can go read it later. It's in uh, um, and First John uh, 5, uh, verse uh, 8 through... Uh, 12, okay? Now, uh, 13, 8 through 13. First, first John 5, 8 through 13. I don't, have, I don't want to read it again because we've already, we've already done it. But uh, uh, anyway, um, now, let's see, where are we going to go to next here? I'm just hopping around. So now we went over the name. Now, his name is his life, and uh, it's his nature. It's his fullness. And so uh, 
There's no other name given by which men can be saved. You say, yes, that's Jesus Christ. That is exactly true. The problem is Jesus Christ means something. We saw there in the beginning, you know, there was the life, and the life was manifested. So see, it's more than the historical Jesus. The historical Jesus, you say, you know, I mean, he says, uh, you know, that uh, you say, um, you believe, well, it says the demons believe too and tremble, <laughs> but that doesn't get them anywhere. It won't get you either, anyway, unless you walk in, uh, you know, unless you get, have the witness, the three witnesses. So it's the witness of the water, the witness of the blood, and the witness of the spirit. So um, uh, uh, anyway, um, now, Yeah, we're going to talk about uh, we're going to talk about uh, using his name in vain. I, I just want to I want to. This is how deceptive uh, things can be. Uh, you know that we've been taught that using the name Jesus Christ as a uh, a swear word is using his name in vain, and and I, I I'm not saying it's not. I, I, I don't know. He hadn't taught me anything on that, but he has taught me what using his name in vain is <laughs> to a spiritual man. And uh, just a second. So now. Using his name in vain is um, if you take on his name. See, Jesus said in John 17, he says, Father, you've given me the name. He said, Father, I have made known to them the name. And he has given us the name. And if we take on that name, which is his life, his likeness, his image. And then we walk in darkness, we are taking his name in vain. So you can never once in your whole life use his name as a swear word and still use his name in vain your whole life. Now, that's what I wanted to say. So anyway, you can look at it. It's it's there in the writings. And uh, uh, so... I just just pointing out things, you know. Uh, so, uh, for you to uh, study, this is for you. I'm I'm putting this together so you'll have something to study. Uh, if if you don't have ears to hear, I I really can't do anything about that. I honestly can't. I, it just breaks my heart how many, uh, you know, so that God hasn't uh, opened their eyes yet. Uh, to certain things, but, uh, you know, I mean, there's a lot of things he hasn't opened my eyes to yet. So, um, anyway, um, now, oh, we're already there for time. My wife just rescued me. I just kept going. I'm sorry. Man, I mean, tell you, it, it slips away, doesn't it? Well, uh, See if I want to. If there's anything I want to mm-hmm. end with, so uh, I had someone text me there, and that was distracting me for a second. I was kind of having to. Um, so let me just kind of say, an, an ending is the Jesus said, "I, I put the seed there now." Uh, I've given you everything pertaining to life and godliness. It's in you. If you're called of God, it's in you. And by obeying the gospel, you you can be born again into his image and likeness through the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in you. Now, Jesus tests that. He comes as a thief. He says, 
as of yet, we don't know. I mean, he said, I, I led you out into the great and terrible wetness, uh, wilderness so I could test you, try you, see what's in your heart, see if you'll keep my commandments or not. You, you know, don't you think God knew what was in their hearts? Don't you think he knew? But see, he had, it was for them. He He tests you to see what's in your heart. It's so you can know what's in your heart. So when the fires come, the floods come, the famines come, the the winds blow, and it smashes against your house. It's Jesus coming as a thief to see if he can um, if he can transform you and change you into his likeness and his image. So anyway, we will we will pray and uh, ask God to protect this word. It's uh, the evil one snatches it. And, oh God. Please protect it. Father, in Jesus' name, we know that when we sow the seed, which is the word of God, that that it falls on all kinds of soil. But, Father, I just ask you to supernaturally protect this seed, protect this life, protect this word, and that it would bring forth fruit, some 30, some 60, some 100 told. Oh, God, Cover us, protect us from the evil one. Lord, bring forth a people in your likeness and your image. Oh, God, reveal to us how the powers of darkness have stolen from us the truth and kept us from entering in to your rest in your fullness in the image and likeness of God. And we'll trust you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Good to know, uh, you know, righteous judgment and the resurrection of the dead. It's good to know the truth about it. I've always put it out there in the future, Dennis. I thank God he's showing anybody who has something to share or ask Dennis a question, uh, they can do that real quick. Nancy, if you want to cut off the uh, thing, you can. And, uh, and uh, people, people will need to star six to say anything after she does it. And 